Welcome to this brief introduction to electric motors for ME1010 at the U. Electric motors are a very common actuator, perhaps the most common one that you will encounter uh, in your mechatronics or robotics and even other designs. Electric motors uh, run on electricity, so they can be subclassified as DC, such as motors that run on a battery, like you'll be using, or AC, such as motors that run off the line voltage. Of course, there are also universal motors that run on either of these. There are many subtypes to both of these types of motors. In this class, we're going to focus on DC motors of the brush type with permanent magnets. Uh, the main other type of DC motors are brushless. We're going to talk about what the brushes do as we look at the different components, but the main thing to know about brush versus brushless is that brushed are a mechanical pollution and brushless are an electrical sensor type of solution. Uh, as you look at the brushes uh, in the hobby motors that we'll be looking at, um, you'll see that they're very inexpensive. This means they do not last forever. You can't really abuse them. Um, and they're, they're an inexpensive solution. The electrical brushless DC motors typically cost a little bit more. They have to have sensors in, their, in order to accomplish the same function. And you can think about also, as we talk about why we need the brushes, why AC, alternating current, um, gives us a uh, good solution. Our goal for this lecture and for lab next week is to have you learn about the different components that are present in DC brushed permanent magnet motors, like the ones you'll be using for the compass. Uh, many of these components that are listed here are of course common to other types of electric motors. Um, some of them are specific to the DC brushed permanent magnet motors. So let's start uh, by looking at a few pictures. All right, in this picture, uh, up at the top you can see a general hobby motor. Um, over here, you can see part of the stator. This is the uh, metal can portion. This is the metal can. You can see it from the outside. We'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Uh, and over here is another part of the stator technically, because it doesn't move. Uh, this is a plastic end cap. And in a minute, we'll talk about why it's important that this is plastic. So it's important that this is plastic, important that the other part of the stator is metal. And then here we have the rotor. And uh, you can see at the end, over here and up here, here is the shaft or the axle of the motor that you can uh, attach this to a gearbox or to a wheel or something and make it make it spin. You can get out that uh, rotation that presumably is why you've decided you need to use a, a motor in your design. Okay, so in simplest terms, the stator is the stationary part of the motor. This is the piece that you can attach to your robot. It's not going to start spinning around. Uh, it contains permanent magnets. Uh, so there, there are other ways, of course, to achieve magnets. Um, but uh, in a lot of little hobby mo motors, you'll have permanent magnets. And it has uh, brushes. Let's go take a look at what these are. OK, here we are looking into that metal can. And you can see two of the permanent magnets. So let's just call this one north. Uh, and then this is going to be a south permanent magnet. And you can see this is going to set up a magnetic field uh, around this can. So that's why the, the metal can is metal. Um, it allows us to set up a continuous metal, uh, continuous magnet field that's going to surround the rotor. Uh, in here, this will be something you want to look for when you take about part your motors. This is a little retaining clip. You can see um, up here, you can kind of see, there's a couple pieces punched out uh, of the metal can. That allows you when you assemble these to slide the motor in, uh, slide the magnets in, uh, push them up against those little ears up there, uh, and then it's pretty hard to get the retaining clip up there in there. So 
you know, when you're really ready to take it all apart, you can pull the retaining clip out. Um, you, you might have a pretty hard time getting it back together. But it's really interesting to play with all these pieces uh, and see how they work. So, again, permanent magnet motor. We've got two permanent magnets right there and there. All right, so here's our nylon end cap again. Nylon. And you can see two wires running off. So let's just say we've connected this up to the our uh, negative terminal of our battery, uh, which is probably going to be a ground. And over here we've connected this red line up uh, with the positive end of our battery. So say uh, we're going to be using the 7.2 volt um, hobby batteries. And so these wires are soldered directly to this metal clip right there that uh, goes through the end cap and this is one continuous piece. This is the other part of the piece that the wire is soldered to. And it's going to connect right there to this little piece. So these teeny tiny components are the brushes. So here's one brush and here is the second brush. One, um, so one of the things we definitely want you to look at when you take your motor apart is just appreciate how fragile these little guys are. And this is what makes your motors run, of course. All right, so let's go back to our list of components. All right, here we go. So we've got our permanent magnets. They set up a magnetic field in the metal can surrounding the rotor. And we've got our brushers, which essentially transfer power from the supply to the commutator. From our supply. So, for example, our battery. To the commutator. Okay, so what's the commutator? Well, to know what that is, we have to take a look at the rotor, which is not going to surprise you, is the rotating part of the motor. And for the function of the motor, that has two main components that we're going to be uh, interested in. The armature windings and the commutator. So let's look at our rotor. Here you can see what the windings look like. And over here is the commutator. It has these copper pieces. And here's one of them. There's another one, which is going to go back behind the shaft here. And if you look at this picture, you can see that there are actually three windings. Uh, here's one, oops, one, two, and then back here is three. Uh, and correspondingly, there are three pieces of the commutator. These two that we can kind of see, and then there's a third one underneath that we can't see. Um, and then you can look and you can see that each of these windings is going to connect up uh, to a different piece of the commu to two different pieces of the commutator. That's what's going to allow the current to flow. So we've got three pieces of the commutator, two pieces of the windings, but only two brushes. So why that is uh, is what allows our motor to rotate. Let's go back to our list. All right, so we've got our armature windings. These are wire wound around, typically, an iron core. And what does that create? Uh, an electromagnet. And in an electromagnet, we know that the direction of the magnetic field is going to be it, it depends on what the direction of the current is. Or in other words, if we switch the direction of the current, we can switch the direction of the electric field. The commutator is essentially just a rotating switch. And so as your motor is in motion, 
and the rotor spins, the brushes and the commutator work together to accomplish two things. First of all, uh, different pairs of windings are engaged at the same time. And by engaged, we mean uh, there are two windings that have current flowing through them. So different pairs of windings are engaged. Second, the direction of current through those windings is going to change. And this is what results ultimately in the motion of the motor. All right. Okay, one of the best examples of how uh, DC brush motors actually work to accomplish the rotation is from Wikipedia. You can see the link down below. This one is going to show you how it works with two windings, which is easy to visualize. So basically, here you can see uh, the two windings, one and two, uh, and you can see that they're connected up with the brushes. Uh, and in this case, the gap between those two commutator pieces, the gap is going to be just about here. It's pretty hard to see. Uh, and over here, 180 opposite. So each of these brushes has essentially just engaged with its piece of the commutator. Uh, and so the coils, the direction of the coils is such that with the the voltage applied as it is right here, um, the magnet magnetic field is uh, generated in these windings so that we've got a north next to the north permanent magnet and a south next to the south permanent magnet. So we're supplying the power through the brushes uh, and we're getting these magnetic fields set up. The rotation, which is shown clockwise here, is going to occur because of course north repels north and uh, south attracts north. And so the armature is going to be pushed away from the permanent north magnet over here toward the permanent south magnet over on this side. All right, it rotates up like that. It, the north continues to push the north away. The south continues to attract it. It pulls over to this side. And next, you can see we are approaching this gap right here. So just as the rotor is about to get to the point its destination, it thinks, where it's going to be perfectly happy, south next to north, north next to south, um, the connection between the brushes and the commutator is going to change. So this is going to cause the magnetic field of the windings to reverse, and the process is going to repeat just like that. Okay, so one of the reasons that we have um, three windings instead of two is that you can imagine you could hit some nice little equilibrium point here where you've got the gaps in the commutator next to the brushes. Okay, so if we go back and look at our, our rotor again, and we imagine we are looking at our uh, commutator, we've got those three pieces around the axle, and our brushes, if you looked at them, more evenly spaced, and of course one of these is always going to be our high voltage, one is always going to be your ground, and so you can see that we're always going to have a winding engaged uh, as this works. So this, whatever polarity is set up uh, with this particular winding, it's going to want to spin some direction. Let's say it's spinning clockwise, it's about to disengage, but this one on the bottom is going to still be engaged, and it's trying to move into the, or out of the magnetic field as it's being um, repelled and attracted. So any 1010 students, when you take apart your DC brush permanent magnet motor in lab, you should play around with it so that you get a sense for just how the brushes and commutator work together to produce rotation.